Alright, welcome back everybody. We're going to discuss colligative properties today, which is uh, involves sections 11, 5 through 7. Okay, so let's start about what colligative properties are first of all. So colligative properties depend only on the number, not the identity of solute particles in the ideal solution. So we don't care what it is, we only want to count the number of particles. And uh, this is useful for characterizing the nature of the solute after it's dissolved and also for determining molar masses because if we can count number of particles, we can determine molar mass. There are three main colligative properties that we're going to talk about today. Boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. Okay, let's talk about boiling point elevation first. We know that normal boiling point occurs at the temperature where the vapor pressure is equal to one atmosphere. Okay, we also know that adding a solute lowers the vapor pressure. So what this means then is that we must heat our solution to a higher temperature to get the vapor pressure at one atmosphere. And so what this means is that a non-volatile solute elevates the boiling point of the solvent. It increases it because we have to raise it to that higher temperature. The magnitude that the boiling point of, you know, the amount at which we have to heat it higher depends on the concentration of the solute. And so we can calculate that using delta T, which represents temperature, is equal to Kb times small m. This represents molality. So if you remember at the beginning of the chapter, we talked about all those ways to calculate concentration. This is where that's coming back. Okay, K sub B represents the molal boiling point elevation constant. And you can find all of these on table 1.5 on page 505 in your book. Okay, so let's now look at freezing point depression. So we know that adding a solute elevates the boiling point. Well, it looks like it decreases the freezing point. Okay, so let's talk about a solution with water as the solvent. If you add a solute to water, it won't freeze at zero because the water in solution has a lower vapor pressure than pure ice. We know adding a solute lowers the vapor pressure. Okay, so this present of the solute lowers the rate at which molecules in the liquid will return to solid state or go from liquid to solid. And so what this tells us is that a non-volatile solute lowers the freezing point of the solvent. So it elevates the boiling point, lowers the freezing point. And again, just like boiling point elevation, the magnitude that we lower this freezing point depends on the concentration of the solute. And so here again, we've got our temperature. Now instead of K sub B, we've got K sub F. And again, our molality. Moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Okay, so that's how we would calculate that. Okay, adding a solute actually extends the liquid range of the solution. You think about it because we're elevating the boiling point, so we're, we have to heat it more to get it to go to gas, and we're lowering the freezing point. We have to, it has to be colder to get to a solid. Okay, so we're extending the time at which it's a liquid. This is helpful um, during uh, periods of cold weather because we put salt on the roads to lower that freezing point. However, if it's extremely cold and everything's already below zero, it's not really going to do much good and help you out. So it has to be an ideal situation. All right, so the third colligative property is osmotic pressure. So osmosis is the flow of solvent into solution through what's called a semi-permeable membrane. It only lets certain things through. That's why it's semi-permeable. Well, this creates excess pressure on the solution side because we have all of this solvent going in and um, it's trying to reach equilibrium. And so we get this excess pressure on the solution side. Well, osmotic pressure is the minimum pressure that stops osmosis. It's the pressure pushing back down that causes it, to, it can't go up anymore. And we use uh, pi to indicate osmotic pressure. So eventually equilibrium is going to be reached and solvent transfer on both sides of the membrane is going to become equal. Okay, and uh, this works, osmotic pressure works really good with when there's a small concentration of solute because they can still produce a really large osmotic pressure. So that's why osmotic pressure is, is really helpful because sometimes we don't have a whole lot of solute in our solution. Okay, to solve for osmotic pressure, it's equal to capital M, which is instead of molality, molarity, M-O. 
Okay, which is moles solute over liter of solution. R is our gas constant. And T is our temperature. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. Here we've got a 3% uh, salt solution. Here's our semi-permeable membrane. We're putting it into pure distilled water solvent. And here is our solution. So now what's going to happen is to reach equilibrium, water is going to go into the solution, causing this to rise up. Eventually, the rising of the column is going to stop because osmotic pressure is putting or pressure is pushing down on it. The solution is trying to go up. This difference is known as osmotic pressure. Here's another example. You've got semi-permeable membrane. Here's all our solute. Here's some of our solvent. More solvent wants to go make things equal. Okay, so the level is going to rise, and here's our osmotic pressure pushing down. Okay, there are lots of practical uses for osmotic pressure. Uh, dialysis, which is the transfer of solvent, and then a, a little bit of solute molecules and ions, so not totally just solvent. Okay, this occurs in plant and animal cells mainly. And uh, if you know someone who has kidney problems, they will be on dialysis because it cleans the blood or the kidneys. Okay, we also have what are called isotonic solutions. And these are solutions that have identical osmotic pressures. If anyone ever gets an IV, it's really important that the solution that goes into your body is isotonic because it can mess up your cells in two different ways. First, you can have crenation, which is when the cells are in what's called a hypertonic solution, where the solution is um, higher in osmotic pressure than the cells. That will cause water to travel out of the cells and cause them to shrivel, which actually we use this practically um, in dehydration of fluids and things like that. And But it's probably also bad for your cells and your body. The other uh, reverse situation is hemolysis, which is when the cells are in a hypotonic solution where the osmotic pressure is lower. And so water is going to go into the cells, causing them to rupture. Probably not so good if it's in your body. Okay, we can also have what's called reverse osmosis. So if osmosis, if osmosis is, no pen, come on. There we go. Okay, um, flow of the solvent to the solution. Then reverse osmosis is the reverse. We're taking the solution and the solvent is going to where there's just solvent. Uh, practical application of this is in um, removing salt from water. So in reverse osmosis, a pressure greater than osmotic pressure is being applied. So here's that pressure being applied. And we get a net flow of solvent from the solution side to the solvent side. So it's, it's the reverse. It's opposite. And the semi-permeable membrane acts as what's called a molecular filter. It removes the solute particles. So in this case, NaCl, or salt, is our solute. And this um, practical application is desalination. So we take salt water, pass it through our semi-permeable membrane, get fresh water. Now this would be a great solution um, for water shortages, considering that you know Earth is covered by quite a bit of salt water. But the problem with this is applying that pressure takes a lot of energy, and this is an expensive process. So it's it's not quite practical yet, and that's why we're counting on you guys to come up with something more practical. Okay, the last part we're going to talk about are electrolyte solutions as related to osmotic pressure. Um, so any we talked about NaCl previously. NaCl will lower the freezing point of a solution more than expected, and it'll do it more than glucose. Remember we talked about with colligative properties, we don't care what it is, but that's kind of not totally true because in this case we do care what the, the solute is. And the reason for that is due to the number of particles it breaks up into. Big difference between NaCl and glucose. NaCl is ionic. Glucose is not. What is going on? Who knows? That was weird. Okay, and so in order to determine this, we can use what's called the Van Hoff factor, which is a small cursive EI. So that's what that is. Okay, this relates moles of solute dissolved to the moles of particles. Sometimes that's not exactly the same. Okay, so in order to calculate it, you take the moles of particles in the solution and divide it by the moles of solute, <coughs> excuse me, dissolved. Okay, for salts, not just table salt, but a lot of ionic compounds, 
I is equal to the number of ions per formula unit. We're assuming complete dissociation here. So for NaCl, it's breaking up into Na and Cl, so it would be 2. Okay, let's do, um, oh, I don't know, what if we had like K2S? Um, then it would be 3 because we've got two potassiums and, you know, one uh, salt. Now, we said we were assuming complete dissociation. That is not always going to be the case. Okay, salt, I think, instead of uh, being twice as effective, it's like 1.87. And the reason for that is because of what's called ion pairing. Some of the ions will pair and count as a single particle. This happens mainly with um, more concentrated solutions and where we have multiple charges on ions. So in order to include this Van Hoff factor, we need to modify our equations. So for freezing point depression and boiling point elevation, all we do is add in our little i here to the rest of our equation. This could be either kb or kf. Here's our molality. Okay, same idea, just add in that i. For osmotic pressure, same thing again, same equation. Just add in the i. Here's our molarity, our r value, our t. Just add that i in. All right, coming up next, we're going to talk about section 11.8, so stick around.